It's been over five years since MoviePass relaunched at $10 a month, and I know this might shock you, but it turns out they might have been up to something. This video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Secure your online activity today by going to expressvpn.com slash Merle for a special offer and stay tuned after this video for more info. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle here with the continuing saga of MoviePass. It's like Star Wars at this point. It's followed me across two different YouTube channels. I've been covering this story since 2017. We covered it extensively on Screen Junkies News. Roth Cornette and I had dozens of discussions about this. And I know a lot of people might say, well, what is there left to talk about? And it turns out there is a lot left to talk about because two days ago there was a huge court filing from the Securities and Exchange Commission which basically regulates financial misdoings here in the United States that leveled the clearest accusations yet against MoviePass and in particular its former executives Ted Farnsworth and Mitch Lowe. And I'm going to warn you right up front we're going to be going pretty deep into this filing and it's only because I was frankly shocked at the level of alleged fraud that was going on at MoviePass. We'd always talked about, even back at Screen Junkies, the fact that this was a ridiculous notion, that it was never going to actually turn a profit. But I was under the assumption that it was because you had two executives, two madmen at the helm of this company that had such a pie in the sky idea that they were driving this thing right off the cliff. But as it turns out, Ted Farnsworth and Mitch Lowe knew from the very beginning, allegedly, that MoviePass was never going to work and straight up lied to people for over two years until the company did fail. So we're going to go into the details behind this SEC filing along with some other financial funny business that I was not aware of. Let's dig down deep into it. So very briefly, if you don't recall what MoviePass is, it's this framed card that's behind me. Back in August of 2017, it was acquired by a company called Helios Matheson. The CEO of that company was Ted Farnsworth. The CEO of MoviePass was Mitch Lowe. Mitch Lowe is a guy who had his roots way back into the beginnings of Netflix. He ran Redbox when it was exploding in popularity. This was a guy that had been at the helm or in leadership positions in several successful companies. Ted Farnsworth, not so much. The hook for MoviePass was that for $10 a month, you could go see as many movies as you wanted in any theater that you wanted, which really turned out to be untrue almost from the very beginning. But also from the very beginning, both Lowe and Farnsworth were the public faces of the company, and they refuted any suggestion that the company was financially unsound or that this plan wasn't going to work. You may recall last year that there was a settlement over a complaint by the Federal Trade Commission about MoviePass's business practices. Well, now we have upgraded to the major leagues because this is the SEC, and this is where things can get very complicated both legally and financially. So the overall complaint that the SEC filed said, quote, from August 2017 to at least March 2019, Ted Farnsworth and Mitch Lowe, the CEOs of Helios Matheson and MoviePass, respectively, intentionally and repeatedly disseminated to the public materially false or misleading statements concerning MoviePass and key aspects of MoviePass's business model. And that's the real impetus behind this filing. It's not just that they said a bunch of things that didn't pan out from a business sense. There are so many tech companies that do that. How many tech companies have said, we're the next big thing, and then they don't turn out to be the next big thing. This is a charge saying that both of these executives knowingly lied about the company's business practices and about their future to both the stockholders privately and to the press and the public. And it apparently started from the very beginning because according to the SEC filing, quote, Ted Farnsworth was the impetus for the 995 price point and the any movie, any theater, any day slogan, which he intended as a marketing gimmick to attract new movie pass subscribers. However, Farnsworth and Lowe knew that the 995 price was not based on market or subscriber testing, and that to become profitable, MoviePass eventually would need to raise its subscription price significantly and or generate significant revenue through advertising and otherwise monetizing the data analytics. Basically, this is saying that Farnsworth and Lowe from the very beginning knew that the 995 pricing model was not sustainable, that they would need additional revenue streams, but that they represented these facts otherwise. And there's an interview that is cited in the SEC filing 
that they did right around the time of the MoviePass announcement back in August of 2017, where they were asked, quote, you're operating at a loss and subsidizing the tickets your customers buy. AMC, the theater chain, claims that at some point you will have to raise your prices or you'll go out of business. Are they correct? So this is essentially questioning the $9.95 price point. And this is the response. Mitch Lowe said, the answer is no. They don't understand our business model. We surveyed and tested every price down to $14.95. Even active moviegoers had to think, is $14.95 really worth it? At $9.95, even people who rarely go say, I'd be crazy not to do that. There's dozens of streams of revenue. We have enough money through this investment to build a materially big subscriber base who we think will love the service. When that happens, we can leverage that in all kinds of ways. So according to the SEC, the misleading statements here are that the 995 price base is not sustainable. And also the claim that they tested with consumers different price points. The SEC says that testing was never done. And anytime there was a claim that MoviePass had done some kind of a consumer test to see what audiences would pay, that they they were flat out lying. And the idea of an additional revenue stream was always a movie pass pipe dream. Every time that Farnsworth and Lowe would talk about what they were doing, they'd say, well, listen, we're disrupting the industry so much that we're going to be able to leverage our influence or our power or our data in order to bring in additional money beyond the 995 subscriber fee. And one thing that they pitched publicly many times was the amount of data that MoviePass was collecting on its users and the fact that they could share that with third parties, etc., and leverage that information. But according to the SEC filing, that data never existed. The filing says, quote, Helios Matheson made materially false and misleading statements regarding the very nature of its capabilities, including that it possessed technology technology platforms based on big data and artificial intelligence, among other things. In fact, at the time, Helios Matheson did not possess the type of data analytics capabilities that it described in its press release, and they had not incorporated any of its platforms or models into the MoviePass app. Moreover, Helios Matheson had no plan to incorporate any purported data platforms into the MoviePass app or to use Helios Matheson's technology to analyze MoviePass's subscriber data or behavior. Even though MoviePass was not collecting basic demographic information for all of its subscribers, Lowe falsely and misleadingly stated that MoviePass collected an enormous amount of information regarding its subscribers and that it even tracked its subscribers through their phones. And a running trend in this SEC filing, and, and I would encourage you to read the whole thing because I found it to be a fascinating read. Again, just the brazen nature of what's being alleged there. One thing that they show over and over is that Farnsworth and Lowe would go out and make a public statement, despite the fact that the SEC has evidence that they say privately they knew that what they were saying was false. For example, in the filing, the SEC says, quote, in March 2018, MoviePass announced that it was lowering its subscription price to $6.95 per month, provided subscribers pay for the entire year's subscription up front. The joint Helios Matheson MoviePass press release containing the announcement quoted low as saying, with the current growth and support that we've seen within the last several months, our studio and exhibitor revenues and other marketing partnerships have motivated us to lower the price once again, offering movie lovers greater access to MoviePass. However, this statement was false and misleading because Farnsworth and Lowe knew that the reason for lowering the price was not MoviePass's ability to generate non-subscription revenue, but rather its need to receive the full year's subscription payments up front in order to try to ease its and Helios Matheson's immediate cash pressures, including MoviePass's financial obligations to its vendors. And this is what it comes down to. Again, it's not that there were statements being made that turned out to be untrue. It's that statements were made that were knowingly false, because again, you have in this press release MoviePass saying like, oh, Oh, we've got so much third-party revenue coming in that we can lower the price for the annual subscription for you, the consumer, to give you even greater access. When the reality of the situation was that MoviePass needed upfront money very badly because it was hemorrhaging money and needed to pay its debts and its vendors. That's what you can't do financially inside of the legal system. You can hope, you can say, I think we're gonna do this, I hope we're gonna do this, but you can't say we've made this money publicly and be lying about it. One example cited in the SEC filings of MoviePass allegedly distorting a financial situation inside the company was its feud with AMC. You may remember back in 2018, there was a brief window where MoviePass removed 
the 10 busiest AMC theaters from its app. Now, the way that they spun it was that they were taking a stand against a big theater chain. They claimed that AMC had stopped accepting MoviePass, which AMC said was not true, but they also said, hey, you know what? We're doing this to show our power to AMC. We're going to take the busiest AMC theaters off our app to show them that our users will just go to another theater if you decide to mess with us. Not surprisingly, according to this SEC filing, that was completely untrue. The filing says, quote, this was misleading because as Lowe texted to Farnsworth prior to the implementation of this decision, the reason MoviePass was excluding theaters from the app was to, quote, impact cash flow needs, i.e. reduce its cash burn. Lowe also knew that MoviePass was forced to unblock the AMC theaters by MasterCard because limiting the service in this way violated MasterCard's terms of service. So in short, MoviePass didn't block AMC theaters to make a point, they blocked AMC theaters to save money, and they didn't unblock AMC theaters because they felt their point had been made, they unblocked them because MasterCard said, hey, you can't do this because you're using our product. Now, because MoviePass had an unsustainable business model, none of this stuff really helped to stop the outward cash flow. And so as time went on and we got into 2019, they began to take more desperate measures. But again, these measures were publicly painted as something that is allegedly not at all what their actual intention was. If you were a heavy user of MoviePass like I was, then you probably remember towards the end of its life cycle, they began to institute certain security measures. One of them was a ticket verification system where you had to send them a picture of your ticket to prove that you were going to the movie. Other users also got an email saying that their passwords had been compromised and they needed to reset it because of some kind of a security violation. According to the SEC, this was not about improving security, but it was about curbing the usage of the heaviest movie pass users, the ones that were costing the company the most money. And the filing also says that this was given a name by MoviePass employees. It was called Project 2%, meaning that it targeted the top 2% of MoviePass users. The filing says, quote, Farnsworth and Lowe directed MoviePass employees to invalidate the heavy user's passwords under the guise of claiming that MoviePass had detected suspicious activity or potential fraud in their accounts. Lowe also directed MoviePass employees to impose ticket verification on their heavy users while telling the subscribers that they had been randomly selected to participate in ticket verification. As Lowe knew, these statements were false because MoviePass had not detected any suspicious activity slash potential fraud and the subscribers were not randomly selected. The tactics employed by MoviePass at the direction of Lowe and Farnsworth to combat the purported fraud targeted all of MoviePass's heavy users, not only those subscribers who MoviePass had determined were violators of the terms and conditions and caused the artificial reduction of subscribers' use of the MoviePass app. It's not what they did, it's the lie that they told. If they had come out and said, hey, listen, we have to restrict the heavy users of this app because you're costing us too much money. Of course, people would have been angry because I would have said as a user, well, wait a minute, you promised me this. So instead of having that difficult conversation, they lied. They lied to their most loyal customers and said, we're doing this because people have been defrauding the company when in fact, they were kind of attempting to defraud you. Again, allegedly, according to this SEC filing. But I'm inclined to believe personally a lot of what's said here because again, if you go back to when MoviePass was always operating, it always seemed weird to me that every time there was some kind of a disruption in MoviePass, they had some kind of a weird explanation. Oh, it's fraud. Oh, we're standing up to AMC. Instead of the most simple explanation, the one that we all suspected, which was they could not continue to operate at the volume that they were operating. They were going to run out of money. And yet amidst all of this, the SEC says that Farnsworth and Lowe continued to publicly put a good face on MoviePass and say that they were doing just fine. According to a variety interview in April of 2018 when a lot of these cost-saving measures were already being put in place Farnsworth said quote since day one people have been saying we'll run out of money I assure you that capital is not an issue I'm sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars of dry powder and I've got bankers and debt financing companies calling me all the time they know they're looking at an uber or an airbnb this is a unicorn company
And according to the SEC, this statement was patently false. And just days earlier, the company's chief financial officer had spelled out explicitly to Lowen Farnsworth the real financial situation that the company was in. The filing says, in fact, on April 13th, 2018, which was just four days before that Variety interview, in response to a request from MoviePass for a transfer of $2 million to $3 million to pay Vantiv, which is a payment processing company, and the tickets, Helios Matheson, CFO, advised Farnsworth and Lowe, quote, something has to change. We really need to curtail spending and usage. I know I'm stating the obvious. We cannot survive at this level of burn. Next week is going to be a challenge. Not sure how we get there. Now, we all know how the story ends with MoviePass, which is that they suspended service in 2019, the company filed for bankruptcy in early 2020, and then was bought out of bankruptcy by one of the original founders, Stacy Spikes, who was pushed out early into Farnsworth and Lowe's tenure, so he did not have anything to do with any of this stuff that went on after his departure. He's now relaunched MoviePass with a new business model, but that is completely unrelated, I want to make clear, to everything that's been alleged in this SEC filing. But perhaps the most serious financial crimes that occurred are the less sexy ones that don't really connect to MoviePass's public-facing statements, but to one of its top executives. That would be Khalid Item. It's a name that I'm not really that familiar with. He was executive vice president near the end of MoviePass's operations. He was in charge of a lot of the day-to-day -day that happened at the company. And according to this SEC filing, Item filed $310,000 out of MoviePass into his own pocket through a production company he owned called Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope basically contracted to do MoviePass events at Coachella and the Sundance Film Festival. And according to the filing, Item would then submit invoices from Kaleidoscope the company that he owned to MoviePass for fees that were not actually owed by MoviePass in order to funnel money into his own pocket. Now, not only is this potentially a very serious financial crime, but it was also apparently done with the full knowledge of Farnsworth and Lowe, who knew that these were not funds that were actually owed to Kaleidoscope and made sure that the money got to Khalid Item personally. According to the SEC filing, quote, Farnsworth and Lowe knew that the Kaleidoscope invoices did not represent legitimate expenses of Helios Matheson or MoviePass. Nevertheless, they approved the invoices for payment, allowing Item to misappropriate approximately $310,000 and causing the true nature of the payments to be misstated in the company's books and records. One charge says that Item asked for a $25,000 bonus from the company, and when he was denied that bonus, he then invoiced the company from Kaleidoscope for $25,000 in production overages, which he was paid. The filing also says that Item received $150,000 for production services from Kaleidoscope that were never rendered, and $110,000 for a Coachella hotel buyout fee that was never actually paid. So basically, we have top executives at a company, the two main ones know that these are not legitimate invoices, but they approve them anyway, which then get sent to the financial team at the company who pay them out as if they are legitimate charges. And thus company money goes to the pockets of another executive. This is not good news. And this is actually not the first time that this particular executive has been charged with stealing a large sum of money from an employer. Back in 2019, it was reported in the media when Item worked at MoviePass that he was accused in 2010 by a furniture company of running up over $35,000 in unauthorized charges. And while he later denied those allegations, he was charged with felony theft, which he then pled down to a misdemeanor. Now, Item, after the catastrophic failure of MoviePass, did what most tech CEOs do after their companies fail. He started two other companies, which he now works at as the CEO and founder. One of them works in the real estate industry. The other one involves the stock market. So great news there. And reading this story, I asked myself a lot of different questions. But the big one being, if I went to a job interview and it was revealed that I had been charged 12 years ago with felony theft that yes, had been pled down to a misdemeanor, but that I had also been accused of stealing $35,000 from that employer? Would I have been hired as a top executive? Would I have been allowed to own a production company that invoices the company I work for for services that I alone have control over the actual receipts for? I'm gonna tell you, the answer is no. And while this is an SEC filing that's asking for a jury trial in this matter, I should also note that no one that I've talked about here is right now being charged with a crime. 
time. Basically, the SEC is asking the jury to have all three men repay any ill-gotten gains, including bonuses or any money they may have received from the company based off of these lies. They're asking them to make sure that none of these three are ever allowed to be an officer or the head of a company that files anything under the SEC. So basically anything that's traded publicly or that has to file financial statements with the SEC, they're asking that all three are not allowed to be a spokesperson for a company that files things with the SEC. They're also asking the court to invoke any civil penalties, meaning additional money. And my favorite of all the things they're asking, they're asking the court to tell all three of these gentlemen that they really can't break any of these laws again. Now, there has been reaction from two of the three involved parties. Ted Farnsworth's spokesman said, quote, the complaint concerns matters subject to an investigation that the company and other news outlets publicly disclosed nearly three years ago. And Mr. Farnsworth's legal team will maintain the challenge to this complaint. Mr. Farnsworth continues to maintain that he has always acted in good faith in the best interests of his companies and shareholders. And Khalid Item's legal team responded, quote, Khalid is proud of the character and integrity he displayed throughout his time at MoviePass. And we look forward to challenging the SEC's meritless allegations against him in court. And this is where we're going to pivot into my opinion here. I'm not commenting on the legality of any of this. This is just my personal thoughts. Yes, both Farnsworth and Item are refuting these allegations. And for me, of course they are. They're going to lie because what penalty have they faced for lying so far? When you look at Farnsworth and Lowe, Farnsworth is the CEO of a company called Zash. He was accused of leading a hostile takeover of another company earlier this year. So he's right back in the game. I'm sure he's being paid very well. When you look at Mitch Lowe, he's trading off this whole thing of I'm a disruptor and the whole movie pass thing. The fact that, hey, I turned the movie business on its head. Even though both Farnsworth and Lowe are basically writing off their reputation of disruptors that according to this SEC filing are built almost entirely on massive Massive fraud. This is my problem with the whole economy surrounding the tech industry is that, in my opinion, there are no consequences for any kind of failure whatsoever. People come in, they take over these companies, they have these big pie in the sky ideas. And when the inevitable almost always happens and the companies go under, the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars that were invested in the company go away. The people that invested in that company lose their money and the people at the top go on to work for another company where they once again say that this company is the next big thing and it goes on and on and on. And I will admit, yes, I do have a little bit of a bias against this whole manner of thinking because I worked for a company previously as an employee where we had many meetings where we were told that this is going to be the future. And I'll name the company right now, Defy Media. For many years as an employee of Defy Media, we were told that this was going to be the future of the internet, that they figured it out, that they can target the right people, that we were building brands that were gonna turn this into a multi-billion dollar company, all those old farts in traditional media, they don't know what they're doing. And I was even in meetings where there were legitimate questions, especially after YouTube changed their algorithm that said, hey, listen, our income has really dropped over the last year and we're starting to get a little worried. What are your solutions? What do you think the answer to this problem is? And I'll never forget the answer that I was given at that meeting was, well, you know, we don't really see that as a problem. We see this as an opportunity to come up with a creative solution. And that's when I knew that we were all in trouble. Now, Screen Junkies was bought by a different company, Fandom, shortly before Defy went out of business, but we were still in the same building. And we knew that up until the day before Defy went out of business, the employees of that company were told, hey, yeah, listen, we had some financial problems and, and some things fell through. So it doesn't look like we're going to have viability to stay in business, but I, we're going to be able to make it through the next two to three months. So everybody's going to have a cushion. Don't worry about it. And then the next day, the executives disappeared and the company went out of business literally overnight. Everybody was just told, go home. You don't have a job. We don't know what the future holds. The assets are all going to go uh, to court to be arbitrated and just and bought by who knows who. If I seem a little angry, it's because I am frustrated with this because you see this pattern over and over again. The tech sector is so unstable and I get it. Anytime you're innovating, there is a lot of instability that's going to go with it. But I think at a minimum, the people that are in charge of this should at least have to tell the truth about how the company's doing. They shouldn't be able to 
just lie about it publicly and to everybody else and then leave them holding the bag while they go on a speaking tour or go on to their next CEO job of the next tech company. It's okay not to have it all figured out, but you can't tell everybody that you do because people plan their lives, they take jobs, they invest based on this information. So I know that this is never going to happen, but I do hope that there is some accountability held in this case and in other cases because there are a lot of other movie passes out there that are making a lot of big promises to investors. And if you're an investor and you want to believe in those promises, that's fine. I think the minimum that you should expect is that there is some truth behind those promises and an ability to deliver on what you're saying you can do. So that is the latest in the long saga of MoviePass. I'm sure it won't be the last time I talk about it here on the channel. Thank you so much for watching. And we've been talking about financial security as regarding people that invested in this business. But let's talk for a minute about your online security. I don't want to get too personal, but when you go to the bathroom, you close the door behind you, right? If you don't close the door, you probably should. At a minimum, it's going to make your roommate's life a lot better. But mostly it's because some weird rando isn't going to come peeping in on you while you're doing your business. Doors are there to protect your privacy, and using the internet without ExpressVPN is like using the bathroom with the door wide open. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website you visit? And what's worse, they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. ExpressVPN puts a stop to all of this by creating a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. I use ExpressVPN on all my devices, my phone, my laptop, and you can even use ExpressVPN on your router so that everyone who uses your internet can share your privacy. Privacy. I just got back from a vacation and let me tell you, it was so comforting to know that no matter where I was, if I was using Wi-Fi at the airport, at the hotel, at a theme park, I could rest assured that my privacy was going to be protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by Mashable, The Verge, and countless others. So if you're like me and believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash Merle today. Use my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Merle, M-U-R-R-E-L-L, and you can get an extra three months free. That's expressvpn.com slash Merle, and I'm going to thank ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's show. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.